Welcome everybody, Stephen Gray here again. This is the Stephen Gray Vision YouTube channel, or you might be hearing this on uh, Anchor.fm or one of its spin-offs like Spotify, iTunes, and so on. So, uh, as with all of the other previous, I don't know, close to 20 of these by now, uh, pretty much all of them except for a couple of rambles by me are interviews with visionaries in primarily the psychedelic field, but consciousness transformation in general and that is the mission driving this whole series or set or program is to help with uh, an absolutely uh, needed urgent uh, consciousness transformation on this planet so today uh, I have one of those visionaries with me and um, very interesting guy uh, he's another one of the kind of people I would call a psychedelic elder, although I don't know if he would call himself that or not, and his name's Tom Lane. Among other things, he has a really interesting book, but I'm just going to give you a quick scan, a very quick scan of his, his um, sort of CV or bio here. He was uh, raised in the, in the uh, mountain country of Tennessee, he refers to himself as, a, as somewhat humorously, I suppose, as a hillbilly, didn't see a TV till he was 10 years old. Um, uh, after graduating from university, he worked as a forester uh, for the uh, Hoopa or Hoopla Indians, Hoopa maybe, you can correct me on that, Tom, in a minute, Yeah. Um, in Northern California until about 1972, as you can tell from that date, he's an elder. Uh, in 1972, he lived, this was very interesting, lived in Mexico in the Sierra Madres uh, with Zapoteca native uh, people and was trained by two curanderas in the ancient ceremonies. They made a couple of visits to Huatla de Jimenez, uh, which some of you may know is the was the home of the uh, very famous curandera Maria Sabina. In fact, uh, Tom met her and participated in a volada, which is a sort of Spanish word or whatever for um, a ceremony with the mushrooms. Um, and his main career for quite a long time was working in solar energy, won some awards for the work that he did in that. And then uh, in 2016, he did this book. Um, sorry, I'm actually, hang on a sec. Uh, no, never mind. <laughs> I was going to go get it and hold it up, but uh, I'll, I'll put it in a, in a title anyway. It's called Sacred Mushroom Rituals, The Search for the Blood of Quetz Quetzalcoatl. Quetzal Quetzalcoatl. I think I got that more or less. Yeah, um, in 2016. It's quite a prodigious enterprise, this book. Um, I've been skimming through it lately. Uh, it's quite a job. It's, there's, it's loaded with really interesting color pictures and all kinds of quotes and you know, experiential things and teachings, etc., etc. Um, uh, I'll mention this again at the end. You can check Tom's website out at solarwolf.com, and I'll put that on as a title for the visuals, and away we go. So welcome, Tom. Thank you. It's solarwolf.org. I had to change it to .org. Somebody uh, grabbed .com and I let it lapse. <laughs> Oh, the rat. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, let's get right into it, Tom. Um, uh, you've had a very interesting life, and you've done a lot of things that uh, that uh, most people have not done or seen. Um, so maybe I could just ask you this kind of like a <laughs> textbook question of what got you into this in the first place? What led you in the in the directions uh, regarding the you know the work with the mushrooms and and connecting with the Zapotecan and so on? What why what got you there well you know uh before i've been on the military i've been in the military before i went on the reservation for two years and just working with government i just wanted to get out of a sort of our civilization in a way and i had a friend that was building a geodesic dome and uh to Palpa, jalisco which is sort of like the switzerland of mexico so i went down to build the dome and then when i went to this these sort of beaches, I saw this place where they had some souvenirs from the Weechol Indians, that the Weechols, and so I visited with the Weechols and actually went to way up in the mountains where you have takes two weeks by donkeys to go or a light plane. And then I decided to go to the museum in Mexico City, mm. which hey, is unbelievable for a because second? a lot of the statues there and, and mm. uh, things that were in that museum is like I could feel the vibrations from them. Mm. Can I just ask you, I uh, wasn't part of uh, anything in your book or anything like that, but the Huichol or the Huicholes, also known as the Huicharica, I think, um, is their maybe own name, um, but they work with peyote. Did you do any of their ceremonies or with them while you were there? 
Uh, I've done some peyote, but people don't understand about the wheat choles. See, the wheat choles live in, by themselves in little ranches all over the Sierra Madres. They don't live in a city. They don't live in a place. But right. there are sacred places to them, like San Abreas Cobijan, where at on certain dates, the shaman would call a meeting and everybody would go there to and have this sacred ceremony in this big dome. And it's amazing living there because when you look all out, you don't see at first. And then so, uh, so suddenly you start to see them spread all out. But uh, the Catholic Church, to try to organize things, they would always wear these sacred places where they'd build a little Catholic church. Oh, yeah. Well, that's typical. Huh? Um, I've just been reading. Um, do you know Martin Prechtel? No. No, oh, he's amazing. I won't. I won't take our time to go into it. But he was trained as a, a shaman in the village of Santiago de Atatlan in Guatemala, among the Maya. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just reading about how they had this sacred tree, a uh, uh, Seishtel, I think it's pronounced tree, um, that. Uh, they claimed was there from the beginning of time and the Catholics and all these people and every time they got a chance they would go and they'd cut this tree down or they'd actually one time they actually dug up the roots but the tree just kept coming back no matter what they did <laughs> that's a well, whole this, of... this this journey of the wheat shoals, which you have to go on to them when they go to their sacred ground Wirikuta. and they all carry an arrow and shoot a peyote there were stories I heard from people up in the village that when they were in the church for a, a Catholic ceremony, that they would all shoot the air into Christ. So I thought that was pretty mm. uh, amazing story. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I think I interrupted a bit when you were in the middle of uh, answering my question that was, how did you get into this focus that you ended up that, you know, finally resulted in the book Sacred Mushroom? Uh, well, that's when I decided to hike the Appalachian Trail back in 2016. I'd written a lot about my experiences back during that time. And I met people like Wasson and actually gone to Wasson's home in Connecticut and everything. But I didn't want to talk about a lot of these people and places because I didn't want the same thing to sort of happen to them that you heard about, you know, had happened in Walton a few places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um so when when did you first encounter the mushrooms though was that um you know with the hippies up in the states or was it down there it was actually down there uh i had gone to chitsa Itza to see the temple there after leaving the museum and i had a really strange experience and a guard pulled me over and said come with me and at one hour one time of day at the base, you're, you're, they're supposed to take a couple of people and they go up through the tower, uh, Great Pyramid of Culiacan, and underneath is, is the Jaguar throne with an actual Jaguar there. And it really amazed me when I saw that. And when I left to Palenque, I tell the story of my book, I was going along in Palenque, and as a forester, I was amazed by how they, they were putting an actual... Uh, post in the ground and he would grow a tree but the fields there had a lot of the Brahma cattle and they were dropping the uh, San Isidro what the what the Indians called the San Isidro mushroom after uh, patron saint of hard workers who used to encourage and give them in the field and one of the things uh, I've learned about this mushroom is you can eat three or four of them five or six of them and just work all day long without sweating or anything. Like last weekend, I was going through the swamps in Northern Florida and it was a hot, humid day. And I took about 10 of them and it was just like I was sailing. It creates a type of awakened dreaming. Mm. But at that time I knew nothing about them. And I was sitting in a Zocalo when this little Indian girl came up and gave me uh, some, because her sister had seen me in the field and it was such a blessing because the legend goes, the first mushrooms are supposed to be given to you, or the legend is they find you. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So um, what would you say, I mean, part of the reason that you ended up writing this book, no doubt, was because you, you're you aware that these mushrooms have amazing abilities. What would you say they did for you personally? Like, what did you learn? How were you changed by uh, eating mushroom, eating psilocybin-based mushrooms? 
Well, basically, one of the most basic things is uh, what they call the sacred ceremony, the deified heart, but the sacred mushrooms are a journey. But here's what people don't understand very well. Even if you read Albert Hoffman's and uh, Richard Schulte's first book, page 46, I can almost quote you everything on page 46 of that book. It talks about what happens with the body. For an example, your nicotating membrane on the corners of your eyes move back. The pressure goes off your eyeballs. I could use all the fancy terms they use, medical terms, but I'm giving it to you in straight language. These two nicotine membranes move back like on a lizard. The pressure comes off your eyeballs in the back, and you gain the ability to focus your eyes back and forth stereoscopically. But at that time, you're able to start seeing the emanations like during the day from plants and from animals. And if it's the right sunlight and everything, all of a sudden you can see it's like the Tao Te Ching that everything's a form of energy. And you start to see that if you walk up to a rose bush, you know how the, every leaf has a little tip on it? Mm -hmm. You start to see like little spider tubes between all the tips mm -hmm. of the leaves and they join together. Each one of these little leaves on every bush are joining together and then the whole thing will start to vibrate. And it's a type of communication with you where you're reciprocating your vibrations back with that mm -hmm. plant or with that bush. And that's something that's coming from your feeling body. You see the uh, Aztec, the, uh, or call it Mexicana or Mexica, not the Aztecs of the, that we think about, but the Mexica or the Mixtecs, they believe we came to earth to dream that we weren't, that we came here, it, the life wasn't important above earth until you were reborn. And they believed in a type of dreaming awake, being awake when you're dreaming. Now there were these ancient sages, there were both men and women, they were called the Tamiling. And they go through time to Maria Sabina, like you called her a curandera. And she was actually much more than that. She would be what could be considered a sabia or the Maztec word for it, I can't pronounce it, but it be the one who knows things. Well, these were the people that would sit and take mushrooms and develop the philosophy of what's called the took, the T-O-T. And the idea of the took is that there, when you're taking mushrooms, you can actually see three forms of energy that are vibrating from living things. And that's how you can do healing. That's how you could do like astral projection of your body or shape shifting. And it will absolutely drive you mad when you start to study uh, the, the philosophy and the gods, if you don't realize these aren't like Europeans or Hindu or Buddhist or Egyptian or Roman or Christian or anything, they are describing forms of energy that are seen under the mushroom. Mm -hmm. And um, presumably, even though you can't see them without the mushroom, that's happening anyway. That energy. Yeah, it's just that uh, because your nicotating membrane pulls back, yeah. there's less pressure on your eyes, and your eyes are able to focus in, in a different type of thing. It's like the, Az the Mexica, the, the, the Me Mexica had different symbols for different types of time. There was, they would make an A and an O, and they would hang things from them. And one of those symbols with an A and an O went, meant like, uh, normal time there was another symbol for infinity there was a but there was a special symbol for b mushroom time that was the time after the onset when you were in a mushroom state of mind and you could see these energy and vibrations that there was a special symbol for that mm. because that is like what they call seeing through time there was really the past you might know about but it wasn't affecting you or the future you were processing everything in the moment yeah, fascinating. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, what I think I'm hearing from you in describing this movement of energy that you are implying is in, that I think you're saying is communicating with you. You, you are um, making the case, as it were, or pointing out, uh, it seems to me that plants have uh, in that they're living beings that they can communicate in the moment um, they're sentient in that sense and intelligent even though they might not have what we call the wiring of a brain uh, is that correct yeah I, I, it, it's much more than that there were times 
where we would have live living mushrooms in pots in the room. And they hadn't been picked. They were brought in in pots and collected dirt and all and brought into the rooms. And we would sing to them in a ceremony. And the mushrooms would actually start dancing and moving around their stipes. I wouldn't mean like they're going across the dance floor, but moving like that. <laughs> and as I reported one occasion in my book, I remember one American young woman, she was sitting cross-legged on the road and she, rug and she passed out because uh, it wasn't possible for that to be happening. It was beyond the consciousness of what mm. could be could see. And we weren't, we were, we hadn't done anything yet. You mean you hadn't eaten the mushrooms yet? No. Wow. Amazing. Huh? They were dancing at the start of the ceremony because they knew we were treating them as a sacrament and we were thanking them for becoming what we call the flowers of the blood. We were blessing them for being the flowers of the blood and helping us, you know. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. That, you know, I'd say that's a revolutionary kind of principle for these modern, you know, rational reductionist kind of technologic, technologized cultures to get the, get the message, you know, that we are living in an, you know, ensouled, intelligent, live world. It's incredible. You know, it's amazing. It's great that you've had that experience and can pass that along. Um, so you, you said that what people don't understand, you know, it, or what a lot of people don't understand about working with these mushrooms is that, uh, you know, the way this membrane goes back and you can see the energy movement. Uh, are there other aspects of working with the mushrooms that you would say people are missing? Like, totally. You know, what? Well, uh, the uh, the ancient Mexican map believe you live through your what was like called Toyota. I'm not saying it right, but through your heart. Your heart has 50, 40,000 brain cells around your heart, just like your brain does. The same brain cells, 40,000 of them around your heart. Now, when you start dealing with trauma or anything wrong in your life or something, that's embedded in the physical body. You know, if you have a little child up until he's seven years old or an animal, they're in a theta state. They're not in an alpha state like we are later. Uh, that's why athletes train like crazy so they can get in the theta state. Now, one of the things that Hoffman and Schultes mentioned in their book, it calls humans to have monosynaptic reflexes. Now, let, let me tell you what I mean by that. Usually if there's an outside stimulus in the world, it comes through the nervous system to the sp spine, to the brain, back to the spine and back. Now, the reason UFCC fighters are using it so much because it eliminates the brain. The, your body starts reacting outside impulse, nervous system, spine, and then back. And these are like what are called almost patella-like reflexes of a cat. So your body's becoming alive. And when you see these emanations, you could see them coming off your arm. Sometimes people wake up and they'll actually see these green waves coming off these emanations off their arm. Well, the interesting thing, if you have a hateful thought, a racist thought, something negative, you can actually see it start to get black and, and the blood's not pulsating. It, you can see it's affecting your body. Now, it goes much worse past this. Uh, I've seen people hold their arm up and just cause a wound to just right heal up. But oh. the mag ma magnificent effect that it's having in your body is the body, and we have a conscious and unconscious, right? A subconscious, it, which is part of the unconscious and the conscious, right? Those three things. Well, they're all on the states. That's why we call it awakened dreaming, because your dream state is fully awake. It's 100% awake. And... At the same time, your normal conscious state is awake and subconscious. All of a sudden, your body, which is real simple, just wants to feel good. It's like a child. If, you, if you're talking to a child, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, it doesn't matter what the mother and father is saying in the room. They want to feel the love. They want to feel the vibes in the room. A little child, it's all about vibes. Well, the body just wants to feel good. Well, it, it's going to, that's when the conscious mind just becomes an observer with the unconscious, because you could say, okay, I got to get rid of this. There's this negative thought. And so you'll form images of it and it'll to, to drive it out of your body. Or I've seen some people like vomit or throw stuff up. They would physically like puke the first time now. 
they're, get, they're getting rid of a lot of tensions all over their body. It's the first time, and that's good. It's like a blessing. It's almost like you want to cry. These are, this is joyous. This is real joy because the body's all of a sudden starting to feel good. And it's telling the mind, don't think these thoughts, don't think these things change that channel to another channel. You know, what you've been listening to that's really negative, flip that channel to another one. Because the important time you came into the world, right? You were born. And that's when the sages said, okay, all that energy is there. But then you get, hear all these channels up until a certain age when they say it's time to be reborn. That you're just a vagrant on the earth to you're reborn. That's why these ceremonies were a ceremony of rebirth. But it's not just a rebirthing of your soul and spirit. It is a physical rebirth. It's rebirthing your body. And you can feel this energy moving from your heart, pulsating. That's why uh, they call it the deified heart. And when the heart's pulsating like that, it gets in rhythm and synchronicity with your breathing in and out. And it's so easy to heal yourself then or feel good because all you have to do is let your body do it. Let your body adjust itself, breathing in and out naturally to how it feels and feels good with your heart pulsating. And then it's just at the absolute perfect rate. Everything is based on what the body is doing to let it heal itself. And the mind's just observing because you're breathing up or down or stopping or wherever it is. That's where you're bringing all these, what they call flowers of the blood into your body for healing. But oh. for the first time person it's what you're seeing is so it's like you're in the garden of eden mm -hmm. that's 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 beautiful tom thanks for sharing that um excellent insights for people so um, i'd been asking you about you know what the sort of you know moderns or western types are missing and that's you've pointed out a couple of really good things and you could probably say more but let me move on a little with you and ask you you know, in terms of being able to access this kind of understanding, uh, what what kind of uh, advice or guidance or suggestions would you give to, uh, in particular, beginners, you know, people who are new to working with a mushroom, but not necessarily just them, because as I'm sure you know, a lot of people, you know, the psilocybin uh, containing mushrooms are, you know, very easily accessible these days you can get them online or whatever you know um, so lots of people are doing them a lot of them i'm sure are doing them in very casual circumstances at parties or whatever you know so you know what would you say to people if like if you really want to know what this mushroom can do and how it can help you what what should you be thinking about how should you approach it etc and and i'm also assuming in that question that you know the people that are going to hear the, your answer for the most part, they're not thinking of going to Mexico and working with the Zapotec Indians. They, or... they don't have to, but there are certain things that can make it work the best for you. It Good. doesn't matter where you are in the world. And they are? First, number one, is try to get living, fresh, live mushrooms as fresh as possible. I mean, when I ate mushrooms with Maria Sabina and these Corderos, they'd all been just picked that morning. They still were fresh and had the dew on them alive, or sometimes they were actually brought into these little places, shelters where we were live living, brought out of the dirt, but try to get them as live as you possibly can, number one. And, and so before you go on to number two, uh, most people these days in you know the States and Canada and whatnot are not getting them fresh. They're, you know, they're getting them dried from somebody who has grown them and then packaged them or whatever. So what in your experience is lacking or diminished by not having the fresh ones? Well, it makes things a little bit harder, uh, but it can still be done. I, it's not like it's, it's because really the idea of the sacred ceremony was that you fasted the day before. You know, that you don't eat anything the day before. Now, you're preparing to go somewhere. And look, I've been in the woods working three or four days in a row without eating anything. As long as you've got water, you're fine. The first three days, you actually get stronger. Like when I go hiking, the first three days, I may not eat anything, but I'm drinking lots of water. So don't, that's no issue. But then after the first day of the fasting is over, uh, you take a cacao bean, raw cacao that are been in a freezer and you grind them with a coffee grinder and hopefully it's been in a freezer because the more you keep things chill, 
that when you pour your bubbling water through it, you're creating this cacao that has two neurotransmitters in it. Excuse me, two bliss transmitters. One of them is like when two people are in love. And this, this was designed, supposedly given by Quetzalcoatl as an aphrodisiac or for young lovers and by Sochipilli, or this was a uh, precursor to a sacred mushroom ceremony that you'd take it two or three hours before. Then when you have the sacred mushrooms, say they're dried, like you have dried mushrooms or fresh mushrooms or whatever you have, you, you need to think about what your intent is. I remember uh, this curandero I was with uh, one time, he looked at me in the eye and he said, why are you taking these? And and, and I realized I was just like Indiana Jones running out in the jungle. He held up a single mushroom to me like that, and it turned into an eyeball. And the whole thing was an eyeball. And there's this thing in the called the disembodied female eye that often occurs during these ceremonies. It's all over temples and everywhere. Wasson wrote about the disembodied female eye. But that let me know that's intent. You need to have some reason or discernment. It's called discernment of your intent of why you're going to do it. Now, the thing of it is, it's like getting pushed out in a river when you get out there. And maybe your intent was to go to uh, Lexale in Mississippi to St. Louis. But sorry, the current's going to New Orleans. Go with the flow of where that intent, because you've given this through your conscious mind, but it's your subconscious in your body now that's all involved in the decision on what's going to happen. So you're, you're letting your body feel good. And you're going to tr you're going to feel joyous because you've taken this cacao and then when you take the mushrooms you take them with honey two at a time and the reason for this it represents the female and male principle they saw everything as like a metronome going just like this and when it got way over here it still had a little bit of male in it to pull it back and over here female and right in the middle was the middle and we're going to go down the middle and so when you're taking the this uh mushroom and cover them with honey and you're eating them, eating them, chewing them, chewing them, chewing them, and you're not swallowing. I don't care how dry they are. Don't swallow. It's easy because what happens is your saliva and the honey change it from a carbohydrate with alkaloids to a maltose with alkaloids to a pure blood glucose transfusion. It's not going to your small intestines. You're not swallowing. It's not going to your small intestines where you're going to be maybe pooping it out because it has to be filtered in your small intestines and then it has to be filtered by the liver. In this situation, it's sublingual. It's, it's been sucked into your gums. It's been sucked into your tongue. It's been sucked in the roof of the mouth and it's going straight to the bloodstream, to your spine and your brain. And your inner cheeks are taking it straight to the ventral aorta of the heart. So you're taking these flowers of the blood straight in. And there, there are ceremonies that show this, uh, the Yututota Codex, the uh, Stellas of Xochimilico. And that's why they had a, they didn't have a honeybee like we do. There's the African bee today. They had a black stingless wasp. And this black stingless wasp was sacred because it made the honey that along with the slava in your mouth, as soon as it reached the temperature, same temperature as your body and your mouth, it was being sucked in. It was uh, literally being pulled into the body, going in as a blood transfusion, the same as if you left an aspirin on your tongue tonight and never swallowed, you know. And so this, this is the best way to take it. But during the day, make sure you take it during the day, outside the first time. And I like to go in a remote garden, somewhere remote, so you, you could pay attention to the synchronicity of nature because you're sitting there maybe thinking something and a crow flies or a branch falls and all that's connected. I mean, Terrence McKenna's talk about this a lot, but I don't believe in synchronicity. If you're in a house and traffic is going on outside, there's your synchronicity, but they're not synchronized with you like the nature because all these emanations are coming from living things that are connected to you. That crow that flew is connected through the vibrations to you. The idea was that you could unmask some of reality, not all of the reality. You couldn't unmask everything, but by seeing these different emanations, you can unmask this. And all this is about your body feeling good 
and feeling love. And here, here's what I found, the most hilarious thing. Let's say a monster come or some huge monster, some big black thing with dripping with blood, with skulls, and it's all coming. Celebrate. Say, wow, <laughs> eat me, swallow me. I'm full of pure love. I'm pure, full of the light, light. When you eat me, it'll change you. And whatever you are, you'll be great for humanity now. And that always flips it. It's, it flips to a jeweled white avatar. It flips to the other side. It flips to this beautiful diamond rainbow children or, you know, to pure white light or to Quetzalcoatl. But it's the thing of it is, this can't be intellectual. You're not thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm going to think about this huge, terrible thing and turn it. No, you're going to have to feel it. You're going to have to feel it. Yeah. Well, you know, several questions came up uh, from what you just said in the last few minutes, and I'm not quite sure where to go with it all. But let me just step back. I'll see if I can remember these because they're all really interesting things you're talking about. Um, back to the chewing of the mushroom itself. Uh, I just want to make sure I and anyone watching this understands or listening to this understands. You said don't swallow. You mean don't, don't swallow. Don't ever swallow? Like you well, chew you're, you, I, I, if you eat a whole lot like I do, yeah. In a certain ceremonies, I just keep eating. There is no limit. But at some There's point... no limit. You, well, at some point you have to swallow, though, right? No? No. Never. You have this... Never. It just keeps going into my... Sucking, it's all being sucked into my gums. The roof. Yeah. See, your gums, yeah. your tongue, the roof of your mouth. Tonight when you eat supper, I don't even care if it's a steak or chicken. Chew, 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 and never swallow. You can take a... Some athletes used to do that. Willie Mays. Just keep chewing, yeah. and it will all go subliminally eventually. But at some point, you're either going to have to swallow or spit it out, aren't you? There's going to be no, something. No, 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 no. It's 100%. It'll all dissolve in your mouth? All dissolve in my mouth. That's 100%. That is really interesting, yeah. 100% dissolves in my mouth. <laughs> okay. And uh, then I eat more, and I keep eating more, uh -huh. and it's just like all of a sudden my mouth is full of uh, honey and mushrooms, and it's all dissolving and and all going into my gums. It's going into my cheeks. Yep. It's going into uh, the roof of my mouth and going straight as a straight blood transfusion, unfiltered, unfiltered, mm -hmm. straight to the brain, the spine, and the ventral aorta of the heart. That is so interesting. Okay. Next question on what you've been talking about. You said first time go outside, etc. You know, and you know, but in a beautiful place or you know where you're synchronized with the kinds of energies around, like nature, you know, birds, whatever. Uh, Terence McKenna, you know, obviously you just made reference to him a moment ago. Uh, he talks about doing the mushrooms in silent darkness, you know, with eyes closed, and then there's all these visions and whatnot. So well, that seems that's like a very... Well, but that's I, but I don't agree with that. And I, like Dennis, he was an amazing wordsmith. Terrence, we're talking about Terrence. I'm Terrence, but I met his brother Dennis and talked to him, and they never were with the Curanderos. They were all self-taught. If you imagine, like, uh, say, somebody finding a plane out on the desert that never seen a plane before. Uh -huh. Well, Terrence was like that, and he had a natural ability to fly, and he learned a lot, but he never uh, had a pilot or instructor. And there's certain things my, my instructor told me not to do that I did do, but, and he said that, you know, you're going to have to learn from this. I know you want to do this, but you're going to have to learn from it. And those were bad experiences. There's some things that are sort of, uh, but they turn beautiful in the end. There's something that's sort of tended to where you have a tendency toward male or female because Quetzalcoatl is the male-female uh, diamond plume serpent. Yes. Okay. So um, another question from something you said a moment ago, and that is you said that, you know, even if there's some kind of uh, terrible-looking monster coming toward you, uh, surrender to it. Uh, um, and I just want to ask you a little bit about that because in some circles in you know, psychedelic entheogenic work such as uh, ayahuasca, the mestizo shamanism of the upper Amazon, uh, they will say that there are harmful beings or, you know, that, that, that are independent of you um, and they are potentially there to harm. Um, are, is there well, no I think the, the, the reason people get that is there, it's because of the Western academic mind 
who's been trained since uh, their birth in the great chain of being and duality. And when people are by mushroom, they understand that uh, everything's the same thing. It's you just got to flip to the other side. It's one expression of the same side. Everything's coming. Look, your ship that comes out of your end is no more sacred than this mushroom is, okay? Everything is sacred in the teot. And uh, one of the things my current Daryl first taught me is just before it's anything else, it's food. Why? The well, food is important because it keeps us alive. And so it's actually food. But the idea that you treat it all as sacred, that's why when you say a blessing, you would say it a blessing for your food because you realize this is a blessing and you're being able to participate in a blessing. Mm -hmm. So if you take these mushrooms with the kind of attitude and tension you spoke about and do it the way you, that you do it and some horrible looking monster shows up, you don't need to be concerned that it's something that could do you harm. Is that correct? No, absolutely. You uh, embrace it. You, you mm -hmm. have to feel and you say you feel love for it and, and you embrace it and it mm. will uh, flip over. And one of the greatest experiences I had, which they often say you, the, the by Currendell, you there's a trip to heaven. He says, you've been to heaven enough. To, uh, you've seen the tree of life in heaven during the day. He said, after sunset, there's a, there's a thing where you can go into the underworld. We're not, we're not talking about hell, but we're talking about the underworld. And you go in there in the real outside. I'm not talking about in your mind. And all of a sudden, every leaf on a tree is a snake trying to bite you, and every root is a rat trying to get you, and you hear all the animals after you, and it's really real. I mean, you are now in a mushroom vision where you're seeing the leaves on trees trying to bite you like a, a viper, and a, the roots are rats. And then all of a sudden, you realize, well, I'm as bad as it could get. I'm in the underworld. And so your first thought is back, well, how do you get out of it? The only way you get out of it is love it. Feel it, feel it all coming. You've got to feel it. It's coming from your feelings and then it all amazingly changes. It Very. amazingly changes, but you have to feel it. It's not an intellectual thing. Mm -hmm. You have to feel this and feel happy about it and enjoy us because these are your comrades. You, see, you understand that these are avatars in this world. I've done the mushroom with Vietnamese Buddhist priest. I've done it with the Russian midget uh <laughs> all sorts of people and they all see us all a lot of these same motifs because you know young talks about the shadow world and the shadow right well this is not the same thing but they are people in this world that exist in this world and you you mentioned uh mckenna he mentioned about albert hoffman who said you know that was the difference there were entities and beings in this just like that are in your dream world but they're all your comrades but they're also guarding passageways they're also guarding portals to them and if you're not ready for them you probably won't want to go through because you have to achieve this thing of where you know you love them mm -hmm. and you have to get and, and this is also getting past the point of where you're concerned with death or not you're no longer concerned with death or, or not mm -hmm. at all it's not like you're crazy you're not going to go commit suicide or jump off a cliff, you know, something like that. But this is a uh, reality because you're in that moment. You're just processing everything. Mm -hmm. That does sound, correct me again if I'm wrong, it does sound kind of like advanced work in a sense, like not everybody, as you say, is ready to uh, go through these kind of portals, right? Well, I think everybody is ready for their body to feel love and to feel love from all this mm. and, and to feel there's all this kinship. I do think that the bad thing today is we live in a, what I call a simulation of the real. And that's why I always believe if you're going to do this, have a day before that you do like a day of silence as much as a day of a, a fast of food, you know, and do dance, uh, do yoga, do whatever exercise is natural and normal to you. If you just want to walk, just walk. But then there's the day of when you do the balada, whatever that you've determined from your intent the other day. And you're, you're and look at this as joyous. This is going to be a joyous event. But then the next day afterwards, you've been like a Western person. And I talk about this who don't own, understand the tail or they don't understand the chi of the Tao Te Ching, because these are the only two things that 
speak like this, the Tao Te Ching and the tail, you're like a fish and you've been in the water swimming around and now you leap out for 10 hours and you're up there flying with the birds and the birds are singing and everything's happy. And then you go back in the water. You got maybe amazing benefits, maybe amazing benefits, but more in doubt, more probably likely. And you know what happened? But because you have this Western dualistic language, no matter what you think you know about everything is one, you're using this language to describe a monistic thing. You're trying to describe bird singing and bird talk and bird flying with fish language. But that's okay. <laughs> Just you know, you could learn you could learn bird language later, you know, but enjoy it. Just enjoy what's going on. Hmm. So the key message is uh, don't try to understand. Like David Byrne's old movie, uh, concert movie, Stop Making Sense. Yeah, Stop Making The house is burning down or something. Yeah. Stop well, they had Making a, Sense. Yeah, he did a great um, a great uh, concert video um, movie. It was a movie. It went you know, to the theaters and all that. It was, it was just, a, it's just a concert. And the title of, of the concert and the movie was Stop Making Sense. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, so that's great about, uh, um, you know, know that that's really good advice i think you know like lo love whatever is coming toward you do you just you know we, this is just a little sidebar basically but just out of curiosity uh did you ever do you ever remember a book that was published back in the 70s called the lazy man's guide to enlightenment yeah yeah you remember that one one of his yeah. things was um when you learn to love hell you'll be in heaven well there's always the saying it but the thing of it is uh, to western man a lot of stuff comes out as something you're doing the thinking thing uh -huh. and it has to be the feeling feeling heart that's in control in this situation because it really is it's it's what i call the sacred triangle the conscious and subconscious there with the conscious mind they're in a you're an awakened dreaming now that's why they have this separate symbol from a mushroom time mm -hmm. but at the same time it's a physical body that's letting you know that everything's the ship is okay. Everything's saying, I feel good. You know, what's that song? James Brown, I feel good. Yeah, that's well, it's like that's you're just it. moving through time, yeah. you know. I knew that I would. Yeah, I knew that I would. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I, I specific this is not. You know, this is a bit of a non sequitur in a sense, but it's still in the category here. Uh, Right in the title of your book, you use the word uh, Quetzal, Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl um, and uh, it comes that name comes up a lot in the book. Uh, could you say a bit more like who that is? I mean, the, the way you talk about him in the book occasionally, it sounds like a person who had students, but you've also referred to him as a god. So it's well, a two, the, a two the part question. Well, the legend was oh, ahead, way yeah. before the Mexicana, way before yeah. the Aztecs came out of the desert. Sometime about two to three hundred years after Christ, maybe 300, 400 years, there was this man king of the Toltecs who created all of Tehuacan. And this man king, whose father had been a man king, was Quetzalcoatl. Hmm. Now, the legend is in these sacred ceremonies that uh, Quetzalcoatl which was an energy form represented male, female, the Quetzal being the female, right? And that's the all seeing eye, the all seeing female eye. And then you have the Quetzal, the serpent, the male serpent, but it was the blood from the penis of the serpent that fell to the ground where the firstborn of the sun were born. Now this was, they're talking about the sun prince, Sochapilli, but this is a, male, female with a serpent. And from the serpent blow, blood that had penetrated the earth, it caused these holy sacred children to grow and come about. And that made the connection between the cosmos and the heart and man and the earth below and reciprocating sort of energy. Because it may sound amazing to you, but if you study in anthropology up until then, there wasn't any gods. They had this. They had witches and and wizards. And like the witch would be somebody would say, "Oh, the game's over there. Let's go get it." You know, that's where the game is. Well, Quetzalcoatl. They had been. The legend was. 
human sacrifice and war between tribes. And he stopped all that. He said, you shouldn't even sacrifice anything more than a butterfly, that God doesn't want anybody's blood. That this is a blessing for everybody. And so he taught these ceremonies and created Teotihuacan and maybe later went on to become Kulikan. But in the ceremony itself, there were certain ceremony itself that like, if you follow the procedures, like I talked about, eating with the mouth and the chocolate and preparing for it, if you wanted to emerge and meet Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl will come. Okay. And I've been out in the desert before, like in Utah, in a healing ceremony in Goblin Valley, and it's, it's amazing. Just the wind comes up, all of a sudden a spiraling wind. And then this jeweled rainbow serpent comes, and you could say, okay, I'm this crazy old man sitting in there in this room but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have seen the same thing or forms of that avatar because the avatar itself can shape shift. That's what shape shifting is about. It can shape shift into something else because the, your eyes optically are putting these pixels together. Let me, you know, I told you, I never saw a TV till I was 10, right? Mm -hmm. Well, my parents put the TV in the house and had it on, but with no sound, they had the sound off. And I came in from the woods and I was playing with stuff and I was sitting there for about 10 minutes and I couldn't see anything. And then all of a sudden I was able to put all those pixels on the screen together. And I'll never forget, there was some cowboys on a horse moving across the stream. And I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, but, but the eyes had to be trained to see that. Mm -hmm. Well, the mushroom is putting your eyes in a position. You could see the vitality, the emanations coming from plants, from animals, and even from people to people, it's called a weaving type of in, in, uh, vibration. Some, all, everything is glowing and having vibrations, but some of them are coming like a bouncing ball. They're, they're like oscillating. And some of them are spiraling and twisting, turning and twisting and spinning, but some of them are interweaving. And that's why they would often say to have your shoes off so you could be able to bear earth or be on a woven mat, they would call them serpent mats if you had a natural fiber mat because your vision would go into a place where you would actually be leaving your body. And, and that's fine. And what, what I tell people, if any of these things happen to you, don't pay attention to them. It's just imagine you're going on this road and everything's fantastic. And all of a sudden you find yourself on a, a bicycle or motorcycle. Don't pay attention to the bicycle or motorcycle. Go with it, because if you start looking at the bicycle or motorcycle, it's going to slip through your hands or you're going to hit a pole. Just go with all these intuitive things that are happening because you're in, you're in this waking dream. You're in a wake and dreaming state. You know, it's not the same as just being awake during the day, even though it is like being awake during the day. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I love this advice you're giving people. I hope lots of people watch this because they've got, they'll get some great information from this. Um, just one more thing on uh, Quetzalcoatl before we leave it. Uh, you, I believe you implied in one of the things you've said in the last few minutes that uh, as, a, as an avatar or a kind of a guiding spirit, he's, he's actually accessible to... I am, I'm assuming anyone, but, you know, somebody taking the mushrooms in their, you know, apartment in Canada or somewhere, they too can appeal to Quetzalcoatl? Well, look, all these different forms are coming out of the mushroom and they're like avatars. And you'll see this. You see, Quetzalcoatl can change into his grandmother and he can change into his sister and Quetzalcoatl can... Uh, become Talak, his faithful friend and brother. All of these are energy forms that we're forming and seeing with our eyes, just like when I was a little kid watching TV. Mm -hmm. And they can be communicated with. And uh, they're like comrades. This is this is not sorcery. You're not summoning something up. Right. You know, these, these are showing up and they'll be your friends and they'll help you but they aren't going to share any illusions with you. You're still in reality, you know. Mm -hmm. You can ask to gain strength from them or you can learn something, but uh, a lot of this takes a lot of time, but you have to realize that you're welcome in this world. You are welcome. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Because they want you in this world. I think one thing Terrence will say, they, they need to tell people straight up, quit treating the world is stock. Try, quit seeing when you see a tree, you only see a lumber yard, or you see land, you only see a gravel pit. Mm -hmm. 
Beautiful. Yeah. Um, so uh, just another little logistical clarification here. Are you suggesting in general that people uh, under the influence of the mushrooms keep their eyes open? Absolutely. Mm, interesting. During yeah. the, especially during the day, uh, Maria Sabina, even at night, didn't have her eyes closed. She didn't close her eyes. Mm. Okay. I wish I'd known that 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't need to. In fact, I was having a friend talk to me the other day about a friend of him, his that's gone blind, and uh, he was trying to take mushrooms and see now, and it's sort of like somehow he's seeing in black and white inside, but if he goes outside, he'll see in color. <laughs> mm, lovely. Okay, so here's another question. Uh, well, it's kind of a two-phased question in a sense. Um, uh, you uh, okay? So let me just ask this as a separate question, and I'll get to the second one. Sure. The first question is: I'm gathering from what you're saying that, in in your view, it's okay to do this alone. You don't necessarily need a guide with you or a sitter. Is that correct? Well, yeah. You got to realize that this is not a cruise ship, and let me say what I mean by that. If you feel like you need a guide or you need somebody there, sometimes I'd be in the mountains and somebody come around. You know. Mm hmm. And I'd say, look, I, I'll help you, but I, I'll, I'll show you where the river is and I'll get you in the boat, but you're on your own here with this thing because it's not like, uh, like my son is a guide on the Amazon down in Manaus for ayahuasca and different places. But the thing of it is, is uh, I tell people, the sacred mushroom can like get you to the sacred vessel on the river, but then you're you're putting the work in yourself. You're paddling. This oh. is very active. Yeah. You know, like sometimes when I take an ayahuasca, I feel like it's all visionary. You're seeing this vision. It's like you're seeing a movie of your life and you're seeing all this stuff and you can paddle around and go in different directions with it. Uh -huh. But with the sacred mushroom, if you want to, you can get very active. You can get out and inter interact in the visions themselves for healing for holographic proje projection, for types of divination, and other things that have to do mainly with with healing the body and stuff like this through uh, your own dealing with the body and the mind. You know, you're trying to breathe air in. It's just a matter, all it is is you're letting your body do it. Gal, away, sit there, be calm, and let your body breathe and pull in air and do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so, in your opinion, it's not, um, for some people, it's not necessarily dangerous to do this by themselves. They don't have to have another person just keeping an eye on them, even like a sitter or anything like that. Well, I always tell people I like to go on a farm or a park or the wilderness. I go backpacking sometimes three or four days at a time. I like to be somewhere. If you, you know, you just need to be uh, away from sort of like, what I'd call the mainstream of civilization, you know, because it's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it would be nice to do it with a loved one or with a good friend. Yeah. But you also, it's a lot of times, even in the mountains, we would have somebody that be just sort of on an outlook. They'd be watching out to say they don't want anybody disturbing what people are doing. You know what I mean? It's just like you're having a meeting, a business meeting, or you're meeting with a bunch of people and you don't want to be disturbed. Well, there's somebody out there to, it's always nice to have somebody that'll keep you from being disturbed and make sure you have plenty of water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so that leads me to the second part of this question. Uh, <clears throat> well, let's see, this could even be a two part question. Uh, you've done ceremonial work with the mushrooms, even like, you know, the Villada with, uh, Maria Sabina. Uh, what about ceremonial work is, uh, you know, is, uh, is that a good way to go? Do you think for people? Well, it has to be real. I don't want to put any dogma in it, but in your life, when you're going around, maybe you find a sacred feather on the ground, or maybe you see something happen from your grandmother, grandfather, whatever is meaningful. But usually in, in, in ceremony, as you're setting a time and place and a place to do this and go inward and at the same time be outward. You, you follow what I'm saying? I think so. It has to, you will, it has to, you have to experience. Yeah, you're you know, setting sure. across this special time and everything yeah. at, for doing this work. And there were times I did the mushroom 
maybe twice a week or three times a week, but then sometimes I'd only go one or two years apart. I'd just doing a checkup, you know, two, it's been two years. I better do it to have a checkup on how my body's feeling. Uh -huh. Yeah. And now it's much more freedom to do it because back in the time when I was doing it, you know, in the seventies and the eighties, you know, it wasn't exactly legal. <laughs> Still isn't. <laughs> <laughs> and like when I was working in the solar business, you know, I didn't tell anybody about my past or what I've been doing or any of yeah, that, yeah. you know, because everything, you know, affects you. And uh, now I'm at the age I really don't care. And also those people are in the past. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is, I think, coming to, I mean, this has been fa fascinating. You know, I, you've offered some really, you know, from my view anyway, excellent information for people, Tom. Really appreciate it. And I'd like to wrap it up in a moment. But before doing so, I want to ask you uh, what you might consider an impossible question, but I'll fire it out anyway. Uh, my, my, my sort of sense of things is that we are at a incredible crucible nexus uh, dangerous moment on this planet where the onslaught of uh, you know human activity industrial activity and so on is really risking the habitability of the planet uh, how hopeful are you this is the near the potentially nearly impossible question how hopeful are you that there can be a turnaround that can there can be a consciousness transformation and awakening and perhaps what the mushrooms might be uh, how they might participate in that can is that a question you can address well if you can get especially people born in the last 30 years mm -hmm. out into a farm or a wilderness area if they really want to go crazy like me go up in the mountains in the middle of the clouds when there's going to be a thunderstorm <laughs> <laughs> but just be out in a garden a beautiful garden during the day and everything and uh, don't have any media or anything with you and reconnect the human carbon being with the other beings out there and don't feel terrible about what's going on. Don't cry or anything, but see whatever you can do to change whatever you can do yourself about what's going on. Because if, if, uh, if the whole world doesn't start to see this and we, and, and this is getting beyond male, beyond female, beyond races, beyond classes or culture, uh, it, it involves we're in an age of extinction. We'll either go extinct during this age, except for maybe a few people living in the jungle, or we won't, you know? Yeah, that's what I was getting at with the question. So, And I'm hoping this will stop that, reverse that, that you'll see that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were headed straight into a mountain with an airplane, and I said, Stephen, turn around, look. It's mm -hmm. straight in front of you, and you somehow your windshield wipers and you come out of a cloud and you say, Oh my God, but there's Shangri-La on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. So the first step in that, I think for a great portion of humanity is actually recognizing that we're heading toward a mountain. That's a lot of people just are, you know, like blinders about that altogether. Right. Or they're so caught up in, um, you know, tearing up the earth to make money that they, they don't want to see it anyway. But anyway, I don't want to end on a dark note. So um, I, I, I just want to, you know, again, refer back to your comment that you just made a moment ago that, uh, you know, the hope for the planet is that you know enough people have these kinds of experiences and recognize and do something about it that's the hope right well, you know that's why plato said the only person that should be the politicians and the rulers and the philosopher they call them philosopher kings mm -hmm. they couldn't own anything or have anything because mm. if you take the ability of people to own any and see that's the thing about getting old you realize you're not going to have or own anything anyway it's all a big illusion sooner you learn it the better you know with some common sense but um nobody would it's all it, somehow we have to gain control of these big corporations i don't know how to do that no well i think it has to come from the bottom up in a sense by people having these kinds of experiences recognizing what is real and what's dangerous and as you say doing something about it so uh, perhaps uh, we could leave it there. What do you think? Are you satisfied? Yeah, I'd just like to make one comment. Go for it. What you said, the most important thing there is not their vote at the ballot box, but their vote with their money at the what they purchase and buy. Mm. Yeah. 
That has far more impact on if you decide to buy local food, if you decide not to buy all these plastics, whatever those decisions of how you're spending your money have a much greater, have the greatest impact of all, in my opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, uh, and I I, th I think it's all levels, actually. I'm not disagreeing with you and maybe just adding to that a bit, I think, because, uh, you, you know, it's for example, it's very hard to go to the store and get your food with or, or your products or, you know, if you need a, a headset like the one you're wearing, it's going to come wrapped in plastic. So some people have, you know, while we while the rest of us try to limit our, um, you know, harmful uh, purchases, some people have to go, you know, to the job of changing you know how the stuff is packaged that's just a metaphor for some people have there's an old i don't know is it an old zen thing or something about i forget, i know i'm not even sure if i quite got this one right but i think it serves anyway it's like these two um guys are you know they walk along the side of this river and every, every few days they see a, a woman floating down the river screaming and they always go in and rescue her and then one of the you know after this happens a few times one of the guys says that's great that we're doing that but i'm going up river to see who's throwing her in the river right <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right that's right that's right that's that's exactly right yeah Okay, well, uh, cross our hearts and hope that we have a, uh, a, a grand and rapid awakening on this planet. And with that, I'll say, oh, and uh, by the way, uh, tell us your website again, Tom. It's www.solarwolf.org, O-R-G. O-R-G, yeah. I, and I have a Facebook site that is just Sacred Mushroom Rituals and Ceremonies. That's all it is, Sacred Mushroom Rituals and Ceremonies. I'll put a tab on that as well, a little title. And again, this uh, remarkable book, it's a, it's a large format book, like eight and a half by 11. It's a substantial book with a lot of amazing color photographs in it. You really went to town on that book, Tom. And it's called Sacred Mushroom Rituals, The Search for the Blood of Quetzalcoatl. Um, I finally got close to pronouncing that word correctly, I think. <laughs> so um, on that note, uh, uh, thanks so much for doing this with me. Uh, uh, I think it's wonderful information for people. So thank you. Thank you.